Hi Flosstube, it's Arlene here. It is Friday, February 26th, and I'm coming here today to share with you about my needlework, and most specifically to share about Needlework Expo. Uh, thank you for coming back if you are returning, um, and if you have stumbled upon me for the first time, welcome. I, I appreciate you being here. I, I appreciate everyone being here. Um, we all know there are so many floss tube options, let alone everything else that's out there in the world. But there are so many floss tube options that you could be watching right now. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, you know the drill, the whole like, subscribe, comment thing um, always helps any vid any person's video get some uh, extra YouTube analytics thing. So thank you for being here. So I'm going to just jump right in today. If you are uh, on Instagram, on certain Facebook groups have started to hear about, there's a pretty big event going on uh, next weekend in the cross-stitch world, and it's called Needlework Expo. Now, some of you might be completely familiar with this because you've been reading up on it, but I'm kind of kind of go on the, there's a chance that some people are watching that are like, what's going on here? So let me give a little bit of background. Normally, at this time of year, uh, designers mostly around the country, but there's even some from around the world, are preparing to go to Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee, for the Nashville Needlework Market. It is mostly cross-stitch. There are other markets during the year that are more needlepoint oriented, and it is a wholesale market, which means it's not for the general public to go in and purchase. It is for store owners to come and purchase items for their stores directly from the designers. It has taken place for a number of years now um, at a hotel in Nashville where, you know, like those suite kind of rooms. So you have like a, a like a living room and a bedroom kind of thing. So every designer gets a, a, a suite, which becomes their storefront. And store owners go around to the rooms and purchase. It's a, what's called a cash and carry market. So most of the things that store owners, vast majority with the exception of like fabric and stuff like that. Um, it's store owners come and they buy and they take it home with them. And usually it's been happening about the first weekend in March. Well, let's talk about what's happened in 2020 and 2021. Uh, if you've been watching me for a while, you may recall that I went to Nashville last year. I was not an exhibitor. Oh, let me back up. If you've just found me, um, I've been stitching basically all my life. A few years ago, I started uh, putting out my own designs under the name Works by ABC. You can find me on Etsy. I'll link it below. If you're a store owner, be in touch, or you can also find me on Hoffman Distributing. Here we go. So last year, I attended Nashville as a visitor, which was so helpful to me because my hope, my goal was to be an exhibitor but I really appreciated the opportunity to go see what it was all about, to, to talk to designers and store owners to, to get the, pic, the picture. That's what I, I needed in my mind, what it was really going to be like. So I was all ready to be a part of Nashville for 2021. I had put my name on what is actually a waiting list. I was taken, I was offered a space, I took it, I was all set. And at the same time being very cautious and in terms of optimism of whether or not the event was going to happen. Last year, the first weekend in March was literally just a week before things started shutting down in the world, or specifically in the U.S. Uh, I, there was like lots of hand sanitizer stations around. There were people kind of hesitantly saying, oh, we're, we're not sure what's coming here, but it, yeah. And I remember on the plane, especially in the plane back, I, I saw someone with like a wipes, wiping down her seat. And I remember thinking, Really? And here we are. <laughs> anyway, so I was scheduled to be a part of Nashville 2021. In the fall at some point, the people who put on Nashville, Needlework Retailer slash Yarn Tree, uh, had put out the notice that it was going to be postponed until the end of May with the hope that things would be a bit better by then. And then come January, I think it was pretty soon after the new year, came the announcement that they were canceling uh, Nashville, that even, do we all hope that every, things are getting better by the end of May? Sure. Do we hope that there's lots of positive progress and a, a feeling of we're getting there? Sure. 
is it going to be completely safe and the right thing to do to have five, 600 people gathered together in a hotel where there's not a lot of social distancing space available? Probably not going to happen. So they, I think everyone agrees in, in a sort of a sigh of relief for both the designers and the store owners needing to think, do I want to travel? Do I not want to travel? And so on. Not an issue. Uh, needlework retailer had put out there, I don't remember when or how, but pretty clearly that they were not going to be interested in taking on a, a virtual online option. Understandable, gosh, we're, we're all, we've all made leaps and bounds in technology this year. Uh, and, um, it, you know, it was just beyond what they were interested in doing. Fine. In the fall, worried that this kind of thing was going to happen. Uh, Janice Note from the Noteworthy Needle, she's a designer, you could go look her up, had put it out there to a group of uh, cross-stitch designers. This idea of, all right, if needlework retail doesn't, if the show doesn't happen, which it isn't, and if needlework retailer isn't interested in doing any sort of virtual thing, we might not have any opportunity. If, I mean, designers sell to stores all the time, but there's such a wonderful thing that's based in the calendar year about leading up to Nashville, leading up to the beginning of March. So Janice put it out there saying, if there will be support, this is kind of something I'm willing to take on. Yeah, there was a lot of support. So uh, she, the whole endeavor is called Needlework Expo. I'll put a link below. Again, it is not for the general public to be purchasing. It is a wholesale show that store owners signed up. Uh, they needed to be vetted like they need to be a real store owner and not um, a real store owner. Um, and designers signed up for a booth to have at the show. Turns out that, I guess this shouldn't surprise anyone to know, that there are companies out there that put on virtual shows. And while I think they existed before the pandemic, boy, have they been making a killing in this past year. So, so many organizations and work and whatever have had to cancel their conferences, their workshops, whatever. And there are companies that help you organize this thing. Janice put it into great words for us. She said, there's a difference between an online show and a virtual show. An online show would basically be, um, People would be, you know, landing at a main page and there'd be links to get to designers pages and you'd get to their page and you'd go click, click, click. I want this. I want five of this, two of this, three of that. And it wouldn't be that much different than shopping from Amazon. The idea of a virtual show brings in the concept of being able to communicate face to face and over the screen, but at least being able to have a video conversation on the spot. So that's what we are having. So store owners who come in, they're going to go to the, what's called the main hall and they will see the, everyone who is, uh, has a booth. They will click on whoever they want to go to. They will land on a page, which is that, that's, um, designer's booth, whatever the designer has put in there, whether it's just their new releases, whether it's a combination of new and previous, whatever they've chosen to put in there. And then how to order from those designers. There's going to be a variety of ways we will, because we're expected, we'll be sitting by our computers just waiting for people to click that video chat or send me to video chat or something like click that button and then just magically appear on my screen. Um, so I can actually talk to them, especially someone who's new uh, and who many store owners have never heard of me. I would welcome the opportunity to have conversations. Many designers, as much as I know, will also have ways that, you know, an order form or something that if uh, a store owner wants to be zipping through all the people as quickly as possible, doesn't want to video chat, there's other ways to order. And, and designers are kind of working it as, as each individual works for themselves. And somebody made a comment about this, but it's obvious. When you go to Nashville, uh, not every designer does the exact same thing. Sure, most of them have like an order form, but some of them hand it to the store owner and say, you fill it out. Others of them stand there and fill it out for them. Some of them swipe cards right in front of you. Some of them send invoices to be paid later. There's a variety of ways that designers do things. And so that's sort of going to be the same thing here. My first wholesale opportunity, I am very curious to see how it goes. I will put this out there. 
I'm imagining a lot of store owners are going to come in to the show and go to the booths of the people they know. They recognize the their. Um, I will. Um, if you go to the website that I've linked below, needleworkexpo.com, there is a list of all the vendors that will be there. Mostly designers, a few like fabric companies and so on, but vast majority are certainly uh, and like accessories, but the vast majority are designers. Um, and so they will click on there, and you, so you, I'm sorry, you can see who's going to be, what designers are going to be at the show. You will see plenty of names you recognize, and probably plenty of names that you don't recognize. So I'm picturing store owners coming in, they might have a plan, they, they might think, all right, I'm going to hit this person, this person, this person, and so on. And then they're going to say, this is me imagining it, okay, what are we going to, how are we going to do next? And my, imagine, my imagination is they're going to say, well, let's begin at the top of the alphabet. And as I said before, my, I design under the name Works by ABC, W. I am literally the last, alphabetically the last person on that list. So I'll be curious to see um, whether my, the first day of the show, the show is going to be Saturday, Sunday, Monday, the 6th through the 8th. I think I have those dates, right? I have this vision that my Saturday might be kind of quiet, but maybe by the time Monday gets around, store owners will be making their way to the end of the alphabet. I don't know. I will be excited to be able to report to you all when this is all said and done. So with all of that, I'm trying to think if there's any other intro stuff to say about it. Uh, everyone is excited. Everyone's sure a little nervous in terms of how this is all going to work. There is a hope that if it works well, that'll be the kind of thing that will re be repeated again. No one wants to take away Nashville. There is a, a wonderful desire within our cross-stitch community to be with each other face-to-face. -face. But if there was a show like this in the fall and then Nashville in the spring, that might make for a really you know neat addition to the cross-stitch calendar, shall we say. We'll see. Anyway. So what I have today is to share with you my new releases. Uh, I have been posting on Instagram the last few days. I've also been writing some blog posts. I'll, I'll link below if you want to go and read a little bit more about this, although I'm probably going to say a lot of what's in the blog post today. But anyway, so I have five new designs that I'm excited to share, and I'm just going to go alphabetically. So the first one, and if you go scroll f back through my Instagram, I had posted a few pictures of this, or not not the full thing, but a few like sort of sneaky peek kind of pictures back in months ago whenever I was first stitching it, but I never like revealed the whole thing. And here it is now. This I am calling Evolution. Uh, color's getting a little washed out here. If you can see, there is a, a geometric design that's actually inspired by Islamic design this motif changes as you go up. The color gets lighter. It gets spread apart more. Um, I loved the challenge of creating something like this to help. How do you make the colors change like that? How do you make the shapes change? Uh, it was, it, I, I loved doing it. Uh, it, the colors behind it, you need four different colors, three, three shades of each. So blue, purple, green, and this rose color is what I stitched it in. You could choose any ones you want. By using three shades, you can get a total of five different shades, meaning I have a dark, a medium, and a light. So up here is, is two strands of light. And then comes some of one strand light, one strand medium. Then comes two strands medium, then one strand medium, one strand dark, and then two strands dark. And so that's how you could get like some shading going on there. So evolution, uh, as is often the case, I because I love geometry and geometric things, you can certainly see that as one of the themes of my design work. Um, and so we're gonna say that this this version for Needlework Expo, uh, it, this this for Needlework Expo is my geometry piece. I'll call it. So here the pattern evolution, uh, and. Oops, I'm holding up too. I'm like, that's not what's on the back. Um, and there's also some details about, I did use more than one skein of floss, DMC floss is all this is, uh, for some of these. So I, I did write that out specifically. So whatever color somebody would use, you'll have the information of what you need there. First one. Okay. 
Okay, next up, I did a pattern last year for my national releases, even though I wasn't formally a, a formal designer with, with, my, with my own storefront at uh, Nashville, I did put out new patterns at this time of year. So one of the ones I did last year, I had this feeling like I liked it so much that I wanted to make a, a series of it, and I have. So this is, I've called this lake. And if you have, if you've been around, if you haven't seen it, this is, oh, there we go. This is the one I did last year. It's called landscape. And so I'm hoping you can see what's going on here. In each of these, there's a motif, a simple like geometric motif that gets repeated. It's all completely repeated. And it's about the placement of the colors that helps bring a very simple image to life. Uh, and I just, I, I love the effect when I did the first one. I'm like, yep, yeah, there's going to be more of these. And I'm sort of already working on the third one. And that's for future. Um, but so I'm excited to uh, share this with you. I've designed it to fit fairly nicely in a five by seven frame. Uh, you know, there's so many... There's so many times I design and stitch things and know that mm, this is not a standard size and you know choices have to be made when it comes to finishing. Am I willing to make it a little bit of uneven margins to put it in a standard frame, getting custom framing? Anyway, this one is designed to be in a five by seven frame. And I stitch it using gentle arts threads so you can definitely see some of the variegation. Um, the light is kind of, yeah, you can see a little bit there. Uh, so I love the effect. I also, I'm, I stitch it on 32 count where you would normally use two strands. I only use one strand. I wanted a light airy effect. I wasn't looking for, for density. Um, and I remember when I stitched this, it, sorry, I know I talked about this in a floss two video, the amount of blue in this one if you use two strands, you actually needed a second skein of Gentle Arts, I think it was Blueberry. And I I, I didn't realize that until someone contacted me. So I, I very much appreciated. I felt bad that I hadn't even thought about that. Um, so I think if you, I put this number of stitches on each of these, I, I feel like you could do it all in one. If you were doing in two strands, you probably would be okay. Um, but there's one color, it's the... Um, Liberty, which is the, the lighter blue. Yeah, um, you might want to get a second if, if you're going to do two strands. So there you go. That is Lake. Okay, next up, alphabetically. Uh, so coming up in, I don't know, six weeks or so is Easter. And there is plenty of cross-stitch uh, projects that are out there, designs for Easter. And I'm sure some of the designs that will be debuting at May Work Expo by some designers are going to be Easter themed. Great. Um, for those of you who've been around, I grew up Jewish. Uh, so I put out some Hanukkah designs, for example, in terms of my, my thoughts. Passover comes around the same time as Easter. Passover is not a holiday that you decorate for in, in terms of like little cross stitch things all the way around you know how you might put out springy stuff and so on for easter um or you know snowy stuff during the winter time or whatever there's nothing like that for passover now passover is a holiday if if you're not familiar where for the first two nights it goes on for eight days there is what's called a seder and it is it's basically like a service but you do it at home you don't go to synagogue for it. And is it a fancy occasion among a lot of families? Sure. The good dishes come out. The good wine glasses come out. The nice table linens come out. Many families keep kosher for Passover, so they have a separate set of dishes just for Passover. So the the idea of wanting to present a beautiful looking table is is key. On the table for the Passover Seder is always some matzah. Matzah is uh, the like a cracker. I mean, that's the best way to describe it. It, it is it is an essence of part of what Passover is. Is eating kosher for Passover it includes not eating anything that is leavened bread, which is to say matzah evolved. I'm not going to go on a whole offshoot with Passover here, but um, part of the seder 
is you have a Seder plate that has certain things on it. You also have a plate that should have some matzah. And it gets discussed and talked about and referred to during the service, during the Seder. Well, most families will take like a napkin or something just to cover the, um, the matzah. There is such a thing as having a nice matzah cover. And so I've stitched one this year. So you can make the, the, the fabric could be any size you want it to be. The, the design right there says matzah in both English and Hebrew. And let's get it right out of the way. There is more, one, more than one way to spell matzah. Because Hebrew is a language, as you can see, that is made up of different like characters in the alphabet. Like it's not the same alphabet. You know, you could say like French, Spanish, German, English all use the same letters. And just they're different languages. When you have a language that uses a totally different letters, like Russian or Chinese or so on. So when you go to take a language like that and put it into English. It's called transliterating, and often there is not agreement on how to transliterate correctly. So I did some surveys, I debated. There's basically two of the most common ways are M-A-T-Z-O and M-A-T-Z-A-H. So even though I stitched this version, you, this the chart for this one is also included. Um, the reason I chose this one, the well-known... Um, companies that make kosher for Passover food, which is um, Manischewitz and Streitz are the two biggest ones. They use M-A-T-Z-O on their products. So I went with that. Anyway, so a matzah cover that you can stitch using any sort of, you know, nice fabric. I, again, most people, most families would just use a napkin. So why not have something really pretty? If you are interested um, in terms of Hebrew, you do read Hebrew from right to left, not left to right. That uh, letter right there is the the M sound. That letter right there is the the T. It's like a, a TZ kind of sound, t, like like T T fly, I guess t, t Z sound. And this letter is sort of the equivalent of a silent E in um, English. It, it, it alone doesn't have its own sound in this word. Um, so there you go, a little Hebrew right there. So that's matzah. Um, I did a hem stitching edge, which I'm pretty pleased with how it came out. Um, and as I wrote here, I used a little booklet that I had called Hem Stitching by Marion Schooler. Uh, but there's plenty of videos and instructions you can find online if, you know, you're trying to figure out how to um, edge something nicely that obviously isn't being framed. It's meant to like lay on the table. So matzah, it is a small enough design that someone could buy it this year and get it stitched up in time for Passover, which is, I believe, the last weekend of April, of, of March. It's before Easter. You can look up a calendar if you're interested. I just know that it would be possible for someone to get this into their hands and stitch it and have it ready for this year's Passover if they so chose. Okay, next up is this piece. And I want to make sure I'm holding it right, even though it doesn't really matter. A band sampler. I have called this Renaissance Band Sampler. The reason why is if you have seen, if you've been around and seen some of my designs, there are certain things that I um, look for, look towards for inf inspiration. Geometry is one, and old pattern books is another. And by old, I'm talking like centuries old. And many of them can be found online, public domain. This is a page from one such book. What were those bands originally used for in 1600 or 1597? Maybe edges on, on linens, maybe edges on cuffs of shirts. I don't think there's really records that explain how they're used. But I looked at that page and I thought, man, that could be a modern day band sampler. And so I've done it. Um, getting washed out light here. So I, I love the way that what I used is um, the over dye, the variegated, yeah, the variegated DMC. See if that's a little bit better. Um, let's just, oh, you can see it there. There's some purples and blues in it. 
and this variegated DMC is 4241. The, like the, there's a, a, a line of them that are like in the 4000s, and that's their variegated, I guess, I think that's the word they use, which is different than the colorist, colorist threads. But anyway, I use 424, 4240, and then also 340 as the accent. And I just love how it turned out. Does this have to be stitched on a, on a piece of banding? No, but I, I wanted to. I um, This is, I think it's a three and a half inch ish. It's on 24 count and I stitched over one. Do I think that may not be everyone's cup of tea? Sure. But I know, because I did it on purpose, that if you have banding, this is a 16 count. I think it's about four and a half inches. So 16 count might be a little bit more what more people are familiar with than are, are comfortable stitching with than uh, 24 count over one. So 16 over one, and it, the, the design fits on on this standard size as well. When I say standard, these are Zweigart. These, these are the bands that I have easy access to. Um, do I know that there's other brands out there? There's some places that like import them from all kinds of cool places around the world. Awesome. I mean, anyone could look at the stitch count of this. The width is 42. So do some math to see if it would fit on the whatever you have in front of you. Um, I purchased these a little hanging things, whatever, I don't know what they're called, for the band sampler. Um, I know that this is the top, just because I know it, but there's actually nothing wrong with doing it like this. Uh, and I just, I, I love the way the colors worked. It, it's two colors, like I said, one variegated and one um, just complementary one. You can stitch it in any colors you want. And so Renaissance band symbol, Renaissance because of the time period that the uh, original book was created. Uh, I'm trying to think, is there anything else to say about this? Okay. And then the last of my five releases to share with you, so I make piles all over the place. Uh, so I said one of the themes I often return to is geometry, and another theme I often return to is old centuries old pattern books. And another theme I often return to is lace. Uh, if you have been around or seen me, I also do bobbin lace, which is the way that lace was, one of the ways that lace was made before machines made lace. I'll be honest, I haven't been doing a lot of it around these last few months or so, but my stuff is always there and I'm ready to pick it up when inspiration hits. I guess I've just been more focused in my stitching world than my lace world. But I love to create cross-stitch designs that are based on, in all, most cases, an actual piece of lace. And so I've done it again. And here is the version for March of 2021. I'm calling this one Rosebud Lace. Roses. What I love to do when it comes to these lace pieces, which are basically a monochrome, and you don't have to stitch it in white. You can stitch it in anything you want. But to make something a little bit more textured or nuanced, to do something a little different. And so I've done things like this before. Here's the way I did it for this, this time around. I was looking to have three densities, three levels of, of thickness, I guess, is what it boiled down to, so that it would show in different ways. And so what I, this was on a, oh, this is on a 28 count that I dyed myself. You'd have to go back a number of floss tube videos where I talked about my first ever dyeing experience. Um, so it's not like I could say, you could, you like this color, go buy blah, blah, blah. Uh, I would say you could go buy indigo and purple writ and take a chance on what combination. Cause I was, did a little bit uh, too purple, a little too blue, went back and forth. So 28 count, the densest areas, especially like, especially around the edge and the center, I used two strands of, of floss, white, B5200, I guess. Yeah, B5200. In the lightest areas, so like around here, you can see the lightest areas, that's one strand tent stitch. Tent stitch meaning um, want half of an X. Do the first leg of an X and be done and move on, okay? 
and then the in-between areas, the ones that aren't as dark or as light, which like, for example, right here, if you, uh, it's not showing up super well on the screen, but um, is done with one strand full cross. So there actually are three um, levels, three layers, whatever, I don't know what word to describe, but I love the effect that you get out of it. Because while you could do this design completely all in cross stitch, there'd be nothing wrong with it and it probably would look beautiful. I just like this look. And so I wanted to share, as I've done before in other designs where I've done the idea of different strands, different threads, different thicknesses, um, I just like to share this idea with folks that it, it, you know, your stitching is your stitching. You could do whatever you want with it. Some people like to follow the pattern to a T. Great. That's what works for them. Other people like to change up the fabric color, or the threads color, or the type of threads. Great. That's what works for them. If you're interested in exploring some other things within the stitching world, you know, look for any, any ideas that are out there. And I'm just throwing this out as an idea. So rosebud lace here. Oh, you know, look at the difference in color. I might need to adjust that picture. Anyway, um, so this is my fifth design available for uh, market. And I love it. I like all the ones that, that um, are coming out. And I hope you do too. Uh, if you have uh, an LNS, whether it's a brick and mortar or an online needlework store that you purchase from, you can on the Needlework Expo website see a list of stores that are attending. You can see the list of exhibitors, you could see vendor, exhibitors or vendors, exhibitors, and the list of buyers, meaning the stores. So go check that list, make sure whoever you purchase from is on that list and is planning to be a part. I have to say like all the big names that I know of store wise, store wise, um, are definitely attending. This is their opportunity to buy the new designs that are coming out from designers. Uh, and if for some reason the, who you purchase from is not on that list, all right, depending what day you're actually listening to this, it might still be possible for them to register. I don't quite know what the exact cutoff date is for, for store owners to register. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's done for exhibitors anyway. If you see anything that you like of mine or, or if anyone else's contact your store owner, let them know what you would like. I mean, every store is going to have their different policy, but most are going to be happy to take your sale. However, whether, however they do it. So, um, so there you go. There's, there's needlework expo coming up uh, next weekend. Like I said, today's Friday. And so it starts a week from tomorrow. While I have your attention, while you're here, I just have two more quick things. I think it's only two looking at the list. Yes. Two uh, just things to share with you in my needlework world. I had a piece that I was working on last winter into spring that I, I certainly referred to as my pandemic piece or my quarantine piece. I started on February 29th and it's just because it was a 29th of February that, that makes that date stick in my mind. And I finished it on June 1st. And it was something that I was showing on, on Instagram as I went, as well as on floss tube videos. And when I got it finished, I put the pattern out, it's available. Um, and I said at the time, I will get this framed eventually. It wasn't, you know, the highest priority. And luckily the store that I've been going to the last few years, um, is surviving. Okay. <laughs> so they were, when it came time to me realize, hmm, I need to get some things framed. I was so pleased to call them up and yes, they're doing it by appointment, but no problem there. So. I just wanted to share with all of you um, the framed version there we go, of heirloom lace. So I, I love how it looks. I think it, it's a great uh, frame match. Uh, so I the Evolution and the Rosebud lace that I showed you were both ones that I wanted to get custom framed just because of their sizes especially. And while I was going up there, why not bring this one? So these three pieces, I, middle of February, middle of January or so is when I brought them up and I'm glad to have them back and framed. Uh, all of these will be available for like a trunk show if, if, um, if there's any stores that are interested. I certainly, Needleworkers Delight in Metuchen, New Jersey is my LNS and they have had my pieces as trunk shows uh, and at some point these We'll probably get up there for if nowhere else. Uh, so framing that, and then the last thing, to sh last thing to share 
I don't even, I meant to look and I forgot. I don't remember if I talked about this in my last video. All right, I'm going to pretend that I didn't. I might have, so forgive me if, if I have, but I'm going to pretend I didn't, okay? So just to give you the background story, I had a cross stitch that I were, that I have had at least for 10 years, and I could just approximate that based on some life events. That I did most of it, and then I put it away, and I never came back to it which is really rare for me. It's, it's not the way I work. I, I can vaguely think that I was a little tired of it and I just needed a little break, but that little break lasted for nine years or something like that. And back in the fall, at some point, Instagram did, you know, some, you know, this is your picture from three years ago, whatever, one of those things. And it was, it was a picture of a floss tube, like I was showing, go watch my next floss tube kind of thing. And it was me holding up this piece as I was just sharing the things that I've stitched. And that was in the fall of 2017. Um, so this picture was showing up three years later. And I posted on Instagram, I reposted it, I posted on Instagram, and I said, hmm, three years later, maybe I should get that piece finished. So it had been vaguely in the back of my mind. And just as I was in between some other things, some designing stuff and so on, I thought, you know what? this might be the right time to do it. So I took it out, had to figure out from the little cryptic notes I had left for myself with the pattern uh, where I was and, and what needed to be done. It turned out to be about 2,800 stitches and it is now finished. So this is a cross stitch of a lace maker. It is done on 32 count over one. Um, I love the look of it. it. It only uses seven colors of DMC. So it's like the power of sepia colors, I think is fantastic in this. Uh, and literally I had it all done except for like this little sort of corner chunk. You, you could go on my Instagram. I, I posted a picture when I was starting it. Um, and so I, I just needed to put in a week's time, I don't know, a few days, a good few days, probably a week or so time of stitching. And I'm just glad to have it done. I, I can and should have it framed and on display at some point, which I will. If you have been with me and have seen my, my lace, bobbin lace things, there are different types of lace pillows. And I have what's called a cookie pillow. And the one that's shown here is called a bolster pillow. So it doesn't, I mean, you could see her hands are doing something there. It's, it's not quite the same look as the type of lace pillow that I use, but the spirit of it is certainly there. Uh, the designer is um, Excalibur Cross Stitch. I'll, I'll, I'll put a link below if this is something you're interested in if you are a lace maker and you've never seen this one. Um, I, I found the website. It, it does seem to still be available. Uh, it, I also know other lace makers who've said, oh yeah, I have that one. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has shared that they stitched it, but, but there you go. So I'm glad, glad to have that done. And... 38 minutes. All right. And that's where we are for today, folks. I uh, am excited to be sharing the things that I've been stitching on for most of, you know, the fall into the winter time that I just have mostly said can't show you because I was waiting for a big reveal. I hope you like the pieces that I, and I hope you're also being aware of so many wonderful, amazing designs that are coming out now. Many designers offering sneak peeks or, or full reveals of their um, new designs, uh, we all want Needlework Expo to be a success. So that means the enthusiasm from the stitchers need to get transferred to the enthusiasm of the, or to be with the enthusiasm of the owners, uh, uh, store owners, uh, and we all have a great experience doing it. We shall see. I'm sure the next time I do a floss tube video, you can bet I'll be reporting about how Needlework Expo went. So, once again, thank you so much for being here. I, I appreciate it because you have so many options. I, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the likes and the, the comments and the subscribers, everything. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope all is well in your world as, as well as it can be at this time. And, and we're all looking forward to, to brighter days ahead. Take care. Thanks. Bye.